It seems to be becoming uh, usual that whenever I'm preaching, pastor is not here. And I've always uh, looked for the opportunity to, to, to thank him live for giving me the pulpit. Because uh, it's granted at all. It's, uh, it, it's a great privilege, which I really, really cherish. And uh, I've said this over and over again, but there's repetition. That each time I'm asked to preach, it puts me under some kind of um, it's a pressure to dig deep, to hear from God in a special way. And what I have found each time I come here to preach and in other places is that because I am not taking sufficient care, my quiet time is becoming routine. And I just read some Bible verses, pray, and, uh, and that's it. But when I'm when I have to preach, because I need to say what God told me to other people, then I really sit down, I take my time, I listen well, uh, uh, outside the, what is becoming a kind of a religious routine that I carry out in the morning. So I always uh, cherish this opportunity to preach and um, I, 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 I know Pastor will hear that I thanked him. Um, very grateful for giving me this opportunity. Our theme for the year uh, is um, has to do with some rather the way I look at it, not necessarily spiritual things. Uh, we talk of character, we talk of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, skills. Well, these are the things by which we succeed normally in life. These are pretty ordinary, normal, physical things. And I must for, for confess that I, as a Christian, I always have this problem of trying to um, make the distinction between physical things and spiritual things. And it's usually a frustration because as I am beginning to find, there isn't much difference. There is, it's not as though they are compartmentalized and if you do this, you are doing spiritual things. If you do this, you are doing physical things. And sometimes I try to really reflect and say, what exactly is spiritual? What can we really say is a spiritual thing? When you look at it very Closely, when you look at it deeply, there's a tendency to think spiritual things are things you don't understand. Even though there is a characteristic of spiritual things in that they are not easy to understand because it is difficult to use a physical faculty, physical system, your mental, your not in your 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 sense systems, your your a physical mental system to understand things that are not physical. Feel that at least the, uh, observed, you feel them by your senses, but spiritual things sometimes you don't even feel them you only see the results even though in your physical circumstances also so you have this well at least i have this problem of saying where does the physical stop and the uh, spiritual starts but what i have found more and more and more is that it is not a dichotomy it is a it is a system in which two things two ideas, two concepts, two notions are working together at the same time, one affecting the other to the extent that the things that we see in the physical have origins in the spiritual and the things that happen in the spiritual are affected by what we do in the physical. So rather than continue to struggle with this attempt to, as it were, dichotomize this physical 
and the spiritual I think the best thing to do is just to try to understand what we need to do in the physical and accept what comes in the spiritual and get to understand how our physical actions affect our spiritual being our spiritual well-being so it is in that context of trying to make sense of the physical and the spiritual that I want to approach this question of character wisdom understanding uh, knowledge and skills this morning the question is how do how do wisdom knowledge understanding skills which are those things that we make our phys we, we, we make our even to start with a uh, living we, we we earn our living spiritual and because I believe that if we have even if a peripheral understanding of this then even our work with God our spiritual work with God will have some kind of a impetus will have some kind of a will be able to improve our relationship with a God so let me start by trying to look at those uh, words and the things that they mean the implications they, 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 they have what is character let's start with character what is character I looked in the dictionary and um, one dictionary says that character is the totality of the mental and moral qualities that make a person distinctive character is the totality of the mental and moral qualities that make a person distinctive that means the things you know the things you express the things you say the things you do the way you conduct yourself in such a way that makes people say this is how Tunde Adebola behaves is your character the totality of the mental and moral qualities that make a person distinctive uh, one of the early Bible teachers that I'd learned to uh, respect, A.W. Toza, says that character is the strength of your moral fiber. That's rather uh, figurative. He says the strength of your moral fiber. Now, what does he mean by this? I think it's easy to explain this by given the illustration of if you've ever seen a house being built uh, of concrete you will notice that when they want to uh, do what they call the decking they want to make a floor they put some mesh of metals in they suspend it a little and then pour concrete into it this is because concrete is brittle you can it's it's it, it's brittle so when you when you have something when you have a piece of concrete and you put a load in the middle it tends to bend and with time it breaks but if you pile concrete looks like a pillar and you put load on it and keep on putting load on it it will stand because concrete is very good at taking compression but it's not good at taking tension. When you bend it, it breaks. So what the metals that are put in concrete do is to take the tension. So when you put the concrete under load, the metals that you put in it, because metals are very good with tension, you can bend a metal all the way and bring it back, it's still all right. You can't do that to concrete. So what, concrete, what the metals do to concrete is to strengthen the concrete to help the concrete to take inadvertent tension 
because concrete is expecting to take compression. So the, uh, those pieces of metal in the concrete behave like fiber. In the same way, um, there are certain applications of plastic. You know, plastic is soft. It's a bit more doctor. You can bend it, and, but it doesn't have enough strength. So at the time, there was uh, something called fiberglass reinforced plastic. They put fiberglass in plastic and mold plastic around it, and you find that this becomes a lot stronger. So what I understand A.W. Toza to be saying is that character is to us like those fibers that determine under what level of stress we will feel. So the strength of our moral fiber is a measure of our character. If your character is such that with a little bit of perturbation, you fall flat, then the strength of your moral fiber is not high. So it is from that point of view that I believe A.W. Toza was describing character as the strength of our moral fiber. Uh, character has the dimensions of honesty, ethics, charity, and such values. Honesty, the, 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 the quality that what a person says is true, that what a person says can be relied upon. That is a dimension of character. Ethics, being in agreement with what is accepted amongst a group of people, the way we have accepted to live, what is fair, what is acceptable. These are the issues around ethics. And charity, of course, I mean, that's one that uh, we Christians specialize in. Uh, charity is love. Charity is doing unto others how we will they do men. So these are some of the issues around uh, character. In the dictionary that I looked for the temperament, mentality, your turn of mind, your psychology, your constitution, your makeup, these are all issues that uh, surround character. I have said this quite a number of times uh, here on the pulpit, and it, but also bears repetition, that I find the Yoruba word for character very, very instructive. Very, very instructive. It is Iwa. And I've explained that the word Iwa is derived from the word Wa, just like Ishe is described, is derived from from she, law is derived from, they derive from law, uh, abo is derived from bo. So in the same way, iwa is derived from wa. And what does wa mean? Wa is to be either at a particular location or in a particular frame of mind. So your iwa is where you are, where you stand. When, when, when you do certain things and they say, ah, iwaeni, that means in such things, that is where you stand. That's where you would be found. And the Yoruba also says something. They say, eifiniwa, that your character is like smoke. You can't cover it. No matter how much you try to cover it, it will ooze out. It will, it will be, you will be found out. That is what it means. No matter how you try to pretend and put up a different character, your true character will 
rules out. But the one that I find most interesting is one that says Iwalewa. That character is like an adornment. It's beauty. It's character that makes you look good. No matter how good looking you may be in the sense of physical appearance, which you will find at the end of the day is merely culturally determined. And if you disagree with me, go to the fattening room in Calabar and go to the uh, catwalk in New York. You see that what is seen as beauty is culturally determined. But the Yoruba say it is actually your character, your inner uh, beauty, what comes from within you that determines how beautiful you are. Now, that is character. That is this notion that we are now looking at as one of the determinants to our success, to the success of our work with God to the success of our living in this world that we find ourselves. But we also talk about wisdom. Before I talk about wisdom, allow me to talk first about knowledge because the way I understand wisdom, I think it derives from knowledge. Because I work in an area of knowledge that defines knowledge very very formally I sometimes mix things up but I think when I'm talking in church I should talk about knowledge as the, 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 the as what a person knows as almost as information in that light so knowledge is what you know Knowledge is what you know to do at the right time. Knowledge is what you know to say what you know not to say. Knowledge is your ability to understand, to, to, to live within your environment and respond accordingly. That, in my understanding, is what knowledge is. But when we now talk about wisdom, I see wisdom as the creative application of knowledge. You have knowledge. You now know that this situation is like this. Now, how do you interpret that knowledge? How do you use that knowledge in such a way that it blesses you, it blesses other people, it improves the environment. That is wisdom. The creative application of uh, knowledge. We talk about creativity here because the application may not be apparent. You have knowledge. What to do with it, with it may not be just clearly apparent. So you now need to look at it in a way that you creatively apply it. And we say creative also because whenever you say something is creative, it means somebody else may see it from a different point of view. Creative things are not usually what everybody accepts that this is the right way to do it. But somehow, you know, when you see, when you see a painting and people say, this looks nice. And you say, what does it mean? You say, well, I don't really know what it means, but at least it looks nice. That is one of the attributes of creativity. There is this kind of consensus as to its value, which we may not be able to put our fingers on uh, 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 critically. So when we talk about the creative application of knowledge, we are talking about use of knowledge in a way that it enhances use of knowledge in a way that it increases use of knowledge in a way that is blesses and i'm saying that one person may apply it differently from the other but as long as it blesses as long as it increases that is what we refer to as wisdom i always get uh, uh, intrigued a little tickled by the one of the typical stories of wisdom 
in the Bible. Two women with their children slept and one woman was so careless that she laid over her child and the child died. And because the other woman was fast asleep, she swapped a living child with her dead one. And it became an issue. And it was uh, reported to Solomon the king. Solomon knew that the woman whose child had died may be in a state of mind of he that is down needs fear no fall. That's knowledge. He knows. So he then creatively uses that knowledge to say, okay, let us cut the two children into two. Give half the living one, which is now dead, to the woman who owned the dead one, and give the other half of the dead one to her. So at the end of the day, each woman has half living, half dead, but both dead children. Now, the woman whose child was already dead felt, yes, why not? After all, my child is died, is dead, has died already. What, what's wrong if the other one dies? But the woman whose child had not died said, no, don't do that. Give her the child. I'm sure when the child grows up, the child will know who the mother is. And it became clear from then on that the woman that had compassion on the living child must be the mother of the living child. So that was a creative application of knowledge. And that is what we refer to as uh, wisdom. What about understanding? Understanding is the ability to know what is not apparent from that that is apparent. That is, you see some things and based on what you have seen, you are able to infer other things that you have not seen. Let me make this a little clearer. You see a living creature. It walks on two legs. It has a beak. It has wings. It has talons. And you conclude that this is a bird. Now, because you have concluded that it is a bird, I mean, to start with, you concluded that it is a bird based on what you have seen. But because you have concluded that it's a bird, you are able to infer that this bird, when it's going to reproduce its type, is not going to get pregnant, it's going to lay an egg. That is because you understand the characteristics of birds. You, you, know, you, you understand the bird as a concept, and you know that once you have allocated a particular object you see to that class bird, you can make inferences about what it can do and what it cannot do. That's why when you see a bird to start with, you can't even say whether you've seen this bird before. And your niece or your nephew says, Uncle or Auntie, please help me catch that bird. You don't make a fool of yourself. You tell the niece, it's a bird, it will fly. Even though you have not chased that particular bird before and found that it flew, you are able, because you have an understanding of the behavior of birds, you know that it will behave in a particular way. So, when somebody, when you explain something to somebody and you explain and you explain and, you explain, and finally the person says, oh, I understand. What has happened is that that person has finally found a class into which you can put that thing you are telling him or her and can now make inferences about the behavior of that thing. So that at that point, you are able, the person says, he or she understands. That is what it means to have understanding. 
finally we look at skill skill you see skill sometimes we look we just we we tend to blanket all these things uh, knowledge and skill they are really very distinct knowledge as it were is the theoretical aspect of reality while skill is the practical aspect of it some people say that knowledge can be categorized as know what why skill is know how knowledge with knowledge you know what this thing is you have understanding you can make inferences you can see what is not there from what you see there based on what you have seen you can make inferences of what you have not seen that is having knowledge but when you have skill you know how to use that knowledge to practical ends i always give the example the distinction between knowledge and skill by saying that most adults even young children know that if you place a nail on wood and you hit it with a hammer the nail will go into the wood that is knowledge now when you do it you find that more often than not you hit your own nail rather than the nail and that is not a very pleasant experience it is only skill that will make you hit the nail rather than your own nail so even though you know you have the knowledge that if you drive nail into wood if you hit a nail in wood it will go in but to have the skill to do it is another thing when i was young i used to wonder um, carpenters they just take a saw and they just go and the thing cuts into two and each time i tried it it's the wood that moves I had to be trained that when you want to saw wood, you first of all go from front to back, twice or three times. Then it makes a groove. Then it creates a kind of lubricated area. And then the sides that the groove that you have made guides the saw. And you can then saw. So once you, when you see it, when you see somebody sawing, you have the knowledge that saw can cut wood but if you try it without skill your knowledge can take you little far it can't take you much further than where you are. so that is where we, we that, 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 that's where we are character wisdom knowledge understanding skill so these are issues by which we live these are issues by which we understand our environment and we are able to live within that environment with harmony. Now, how do these affect our work with God? How do wisdom, understanding, skill, character affect our work with God? Before I go to explain that a little more, it is interesting that if, you, if you've ever uh, looked at the, a brochure or any formal material from the University of Ibadan, we are told that the purpose for setting up that university is for character and learning. What, when you see, when you encounter a university, what you feel first is, oh, this is a place of, in fact, it is called a citadel of learning. It's called the premier university, the citadel of learning, la, 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 la. People hardly talk about the character part of it. But interestingly, the character is the first thing they talked about. They didn't say about, for learning and character. They say for character and learning. The reason is if you have learning if you are learned and you don't have character you are a danger to the world you are a danger to the world because fundamentally 
there is no evil force in this world. There's only one force. There's only one power. And that is the power of God. Now that power of God, that power that God has created and has put in the world can be taken by somebody with a perverted mind and applied to negative ends and we have evil. Or it can be taken and used in the way God intends it and we have good coming out of it. So a person without character, a person with all these things we've defined about character, virtue, uh, ethics, honesty, and all this, that doesn't have that, but who has knowledge, is able to do things that can put the whole world into jeopardy. Look at the careful way by which Hitler killed people. It was scientific. And for a long time, there was no trace that was going on. In fact, a lot of it was discovered even after the world, Second World War. And that is because there was this man with knowledge, but little or no character. So character is very, very important. It was character. It was lack of certain levels of character but a quest for knowledge that led Adam to succumb to what the snake told his wife. Because the character was not sufficient to be able to say, no, God has said we should not eat of this tree. But there was that curiosity there. There was that quest to find out what will happen. And that in itself is a manifestation of a lack of character. So, when we as Christians look at the whole issue of character, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and skill, we should know that it is the character that God gives to us by our understanding of his word that makes our wisdom, our knowledge, our understanding, and our skills useful. All these facilities, our knowledge, our skill, our, knowledge, our understanding, our wisdom, have been given to us of God to transform the world. And in the process, we benefit. Because whenever you do anything that transforms the world, you also will benefit. You will benefit first of all because you, live in, you, you are going to live in a better world, a, a, a world in which the works of your hands have improved the situation. Say for example, I, I, I remember not too long ago, pastor was saying, which do you prefer, to get healed of malaria or to get the knowledge of the cure? For malaria. Imagine if you get the knowledge of the cure for malaria, then you, 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 don't, you are not too disturbed if you are bitten by a mosquito. So the fact that you have applied your skill, your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom to improve the world means that you also are living in an improved world. But more than that, the world we live in has been organized in such a way that you will even benefit directly from it. You, 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 the fact that you have brought this knowledge, you have brought this new knowledge to the world, something accrues to you in well-organized societies. Something accrues to you by virtue of the fact that this was introduced to the world by you. That's the basis of the whole of a patent system. So what God desires of us is that the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom, the skill that he has given us should be applied within the environment of character that we derive from his words, from the user manual of the human beings that we are, such that these 
that God has given us will be applied to do what he told Adam to do in the Garden of Eden, to renew the world, to, 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 rule, the, to rule the earth, to, to, uh, to replenish the earth. That is the objective. That is what God has set for us as objective. The skills, the understanding, the wisdom, the knowledge that we need, he is willing to give us and he has given us. But we now need to apply character to ensure that we use it in the way that he intends us to use it. In closing, let me say that everything that God gives us is given to us to multiply and use. Somebody said, I read something somewhere and I found it really interesting. It says, the only right way to, um, to use resources is to invest it. That is, if you have money, you can either spend it or invest it. Now, investment here does not necessarily mean you go and tie it up to a business. That is, whatever you use that money for is going to yield a return that is more than what you spent it on. Even when you spend it on leisure, it is because the returns you're getting from taking a break is going to make you perform more. So the only correct way to use resources is to invest it. If you invest time in training a child, you can be sure that the child will come out better than even you that trained that child in future. So that is uh, investment. So whatever God has given us, God sees it as investment. And that is the whole moral of the parable of the talents. The skills, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding that God has given us, God expects us to invest it, increase it, and use it to bless mankind. If you have any special gifts, don't rest on your oars. Don't relax and say, ah, I have this. There must be a better way to use that skill. There must be something that if you know that your gift will be used either more efficiently, more effectively, and overall more productively. And these are the, that, that is, these are the things that God expects of us. So when we get blessings from God, we are expected to invest it and increase it and use it to bless a much wider uh, uh, population. If we remember the story of feeding of the 5,000, this was doing what he normally is, talking trade. Speaks to people, uh, admonishes them, and then people came and said, ah, we've been at this a long time, well, people are really enjoying what you are saying, but you know, they're going to get hungry in a bit. Or even if at the end of the day you send them home, they're going to go home hungry. Why don't we find some things to give them? And you say, what's available? And he got this little picnic pack from this little boy, and he blessed it. And it increased, and it multiplied, and he fed thousands of people, and there was left over. That is an example to us. That actually is not just an instruction to us as Christians, what God expects of us, how God expects us to use what he gives us. So if you have a gift in the area of knowledge, in the great area of understanding, wisdom, and skill, you need to invest it. You need to own it. You need to practice around you. You need to make it greater you need to ensure that it is not the level at which god gave you the raw level god gave you that you are using it uh pastor gave us example a few weeks ago about some of our nigerian footballers who are very skilled 
natural talent. But when they got to environments where talents are harnessed and trained and owned, we saw that they were doing things that they were not able to do here. So that is to tell us that those things we have in our hands that we think uh, is our gyeong gyeong, there is a lot more that we can get out of it. There is a lot more that God intends for us to get out of it. The, the, the key there is what I said earlier on that any resource that we have, the right way to use it is to invest it. Not necessarily to say to invest it so that you get more money, but to invest in such a way that it does a lot more than it will have done in its raw state. And as we grow, as we continue in our Christian race, we need to have this clear understanding. Now, when I started, I started by talking about the dichotomy between spiritual things and physical things. The reason why I started with that is that all I have said so far applies to our everyday lives. But the fact is, as we are doing this, as we are living these our everyday lives, as we are using the character of God, as we are using the wisdom of God, the understanding, the knowledge, the skills that God has given us, we should know that we are investing in the kingdom of God and there are commensurate effects, commensurate results, commensurate outputs, outcomes in the spiritual. So when we live our lives, we should know that as Christians, there is a lot more to the things we do in our everyday lives. The way we conduct ourselves, there's a lot of it because they have effects in the internal. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you because it always sheds light. Father, we ask that these words that you have spoken through me, that they continue to germinate, that they will not be scorched by the sun or squeezed by thorns. I pray that they will fall on fertile ground and they will produce hundreds, tenfolds, hundredfolds. Father, I pray for myself also that this same word that I've spoken to your people, that I continue to think about them, that I continue to reflect on them so that I too will benefit from what those I've spoken them to have benefited. Father, we thank you for all things. We thank you because you are a God of revelation. We thank you because you are a God of light. We give glory, honor, and adoration unto your name, for we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen.